over the last uh, two, three weeks, we've been doing a few. This is, we looked at what, what to do when your future doesn't make sense or you're uncertain about your future. Anyone got that problem? Here's the principle, all right? When your future do, doesn't make sense, when you're unsure about it, what do you do? Let's read it together. When you're unsure about your future, keep going with what you do know and trust God fully with what you don't know. The G-O is in capitals because you've got a purpose, and that purpose is not determined by all the little details of your future. Get a purpose and keep going with what you know, and amazing things will happen. The other principle we looked at was, what do you do when you can't swim, when the storms of life have hit you hard, and you can't swim, and you feel like you're drowning? And here's the principle. What is it? When you can't swim... Trust God's process as you hold on to the person and the promise of Christ. These are powerful truths, and I hope these will get deep in your soul. Catch up on SoundCloud or YouTube if that's you. But today we want to look at, we're going to meet the Apostle Paul in the letter he wrote to the Thessalonian church. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 18 or 19, I think it is. Um, so here's what he's writing to the Thessalonians, okay? And this is what he says. He says, I... Or we wanted to come, we wanted very much to come to you, and I, Paul, tried again and again, but, everyone say but. Now, last week we looked at a big but, okay? Um, But Paul says, I, he says, listen, I wanted to come to you guys often. I tried again and again, but, but, and this is the story, all right? A few years before this, Paul, the Apostle Paul had left Uh, Israel on a mission to take the good news of Jesus to the non-Christian world, to Asia particularly. So he's on a mission, and he goes, and along the way, um, he's led, and he gets to the very sort of western tip of Asia, and he wants to go up north into Asia, but the Holy Spirit stops him, closes all doors, and he's sitting there, and one night as he's, as they're hanging around in this western tip of Asia, he has a vision of a man from Macedonia, and this man says, in the dream, says to him, come and help us. And Paul and his buddies conclude that God is telling them to go to Macedonia. So the next day, they pack up camp, and they head into Europe. This is a big moment. This is the moment that the gospel showed up in Europe. When Paul wouldn't go into Asia, he says, listen, God's got a new plan, and I'm going into Macedonia. And Thessalonica was the capital city and the greatest, the, the greatest city, the largest city in, in Macedonia. So where Paul crossed over, about 100 miles into his journey, he came to Thessalonia. And when he was there, he preached the gospel, shared the good news of Jesus. A bunch of people gave their lives to Christ. A little church was started. But then persecution arose. I mean, they drove him out of town. He, he just got hammered. And they, he basically had to, had to leave town. And he had to leave these few young Christians, this young church behind. But he had engaged them with the gospel. He had established, put foundations in them. But now he's, he had to leave. And then he writes them a letter. Because he, he loves these people, right? These are his children. These are his friends. And he's been forced to leave them. And he writes them a letter. He says, man, I wanted to come to you often. I tried again and again, but it, it hasn't worked out. Now, I don't know about you, but what your story is. You know, maybe there's some things you wanted to do. Um, I'm not, uh, and, and they just haven't worked out. Now, last week we looked at, well, sometimes it's just the storms of life that batter us, right? I mean, you're, you're doing what you think you should be doing, and then suddenly there's the storm, and your ship breaks up, and you're washed up on a shore somewhere. Some of you like, arrived in London like that, right? The storms of life just washed you up on the shores of London. Um, but in this case, you kind of wonder, well, what was it for Paul that, that he couldn't come? And this is how he completes the, the sentence. He says, but... Satan, there's another but, right? But Satan prevented us. I don't know. That is not a good excuse in many cases, right? If you don't arrive at work tomorrow, hey, boss, I try to come to work, but Satan stopped me. (laughs) Mom, Dad, I wanted to come home for Christmas, but the devil didn't let me. All right? Teacher, lecturer, I wanted to come to class. But Satan stopped me this morning. 
Okay, how, how does that work out? I mean, when you're reading sentences like that in the Bible, you have got to just pause. They've got to arrest you. You can't just read that, right, and say, and just go on to the next sentence. You've got to ask a few questions, right? I mean, this is the Apostle Paul, the man of faith, writing this. This is the great one who saw, I mean, just, he, he says, Satan stopped me. Like, when I read that and I was reaping it, all of you know I reap the Bible, right? Don't just read it, but reap it. Read some, something, then E for examine it, then A for apply it, and then P for pray it, right? And, and read it slowly is what we say here around here. Don't stuff yourself full of the Bible. I don't care how much Bible, you know, how much Bible you go through. What I really care is how much Bible gets into you and sticks into you. Right, so slow down. If you were to slow down in this verse, it should like intrigue you. What kind of questions should come up from this text? Like, is there a devil? Do I really believe there is such a thing? Is this just an excuse he's making? How did the devil stop him? I mean, did this red horned beast with a big fork, you know, stand in the road and say, whoa, you know, what do I believe? What do you believe about this? I mean, is this life? So I want us just to pause over here and say, hey, what's going on here? Could the devil be stopping me where I want to go? Could some of the things that are happening in your life that are not working out, some of the buts, could they be from the devil? Well, this is what today is about, just developing an overcoming attitude for the spiritual battle you're in, All right? So shall we just, shall we pray? Because I think we've got to get a hold of something today. Why don't you close your eyes for a moment? The spiritual battle, I don't know what you believe about the spiritual realm. I'm not sure if you're a Christian here today, um, if you're a spiritual person here today, but I'll pray for us. I pray that our spiritual eyes would be opened to see the, the things that are going on in the spiritual realm around us. And I pray, I see this picture, this, this picture of a, a man or a person, not a man, a person just beginning to develop these green big muscles. I just sense that some of you that are facing some battles are gonna grow some spiritual muscle today to overcome. I pray today, Lord, open our eyes that we would see they are more for us than they are against us. I pray that every spirit of fear and timidity and shrinking back will be overcome in this room in Jesus' name. I pray that those who have been under and suppressed and oppressed and, 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 and just controlled and hindered, that today something would happen in the deep of our spirits, that we would rise up and be overcomers, and having done all, we shall stand. So help us today as we wrestle with this text to see what you're saying to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, so we look at this text here, and we, we want to look at, at uh, I guess, back to the text. You know, So we look at that, and we say, well, well have we have all these questions. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at three things that I think we need to just first just extract from this that help us to kind of see how, how, how it how we should look at life biblically. Now, we call that a, a worldview, right? A, we all have a worldview. We have a, a way we view the world. And a biblical worldview is, is looking at the world and the way the world works through the truth of Scripture. Mm -hmm. We all have one. If you're an atheist, you have a worldview that says there is no God. There is no spiritual realm, all right? There is no existence outside the natural. If you're, I mean, we all, we all have, if you're of a different religion, you have a, a worldview. And by the way, I would encourage you, the, 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 the sort of, a, the, talking about worldviews is a powerful thing, because most of us are three questions away from our worldview collapsing, because we don't really know why we be, what we believe and why we believe it. I'm, I'm not just Christians, I hope you know what you believe and why you believe it. Most people don't. So, in fact, over the last while, I've had three conversations with people who are not believers and, and would declare themselves of atheists or of different religion. And my approach has been, let's, hey, you know, and this is what I've said, you know, my worldview is different. I believe, for instance, in the one case I, be I said, I believe that all life is valuable and equally valuable. 
That's what my worldview, my biblical worldview says. So I, based on that worldview, I have an opinion on all sorts of things. I have an opinion on abortion. I have an opinion on euthanasia. I have an opinion on, on racism. I have an opinion on all sorts of things because of my worldview. It's not just I don't like racism. It's just not, it's wrong according to my worldview because everybody is, or every life is valuable and every life is equally valuable. Right? So your worldview drives what you believe and how you live. And if you start to live contrary to your worldview, you are very close to just collapse. You're gonna be shaken when, when you're challenged on your worldview. Anyway, so three statements out of this text here that we want to, uh, that just shapes a Christian worldview, that are, is fundamental to a Christian worldview. Let's, let's have a look at three, here we go. Number one, the worldview is this, the point, the truth, that we want to hear from Apostle Paul here is this. There is a natural world and a spiritual world, and they equally as real. There is a God and there is a devil. Yes, Christians believe that there is a devil, a Satan, a spiritual being. As God is real, so the devil is real. And he is, he is a he in the Bible. He's not just an it. He's a he just like God is a he. All right, he's a being. Yes, and if you ask me the question and you want to collapse my worldview, did God create the devil? Yes, he did. He created Lucifer, and he created Lucifer with a choice, just like you and I have a free will choice. Lucifer chose to rebel, led a whole bunch of angels into, into rebellion, and now that is a spiritual world. And so Paul says, Satan hindered me. He says, I am make, I, he, he's reminding us and them that there is a spiritual reality as there is a natural reality. There are spiritual laws just like there are natural laws. And you and I live in this world. Now, some people overemphasize the natural at the expense of the spiritual, and some people overemphasize the spiritual at the expense of the natural. Some people, Christians, live so far in the clouds, they have no, their feet aren't even touching the reality of the ground. I heard someone this week make it a leader from another church. I was trying to help another church leader who told me this key leader in their church came to them and said, God told me to leave this church. I'm like, okay. I mean, what do I say? What do you say to that? If you t come to me and said, God told me to leave this church. If I tell you, well, look, I don't agree with that. Either I'm saying you wrong or God's wrong. I mean, there's not much choice. They just over-spiritualized an issue they really had that they didn't want to deal with and just said, well, God said it. Don't do that to God. God's like, no, I didn't say that. God's given us ways to deal with stuff. If you need to leave, leave well. Because the way you leave is the way you'll cleave. The way you leave here yeah, is the way you'll enter the next place. You leave with your baggage here, yeah? you get to the next church, and guess what? The next church, you're going to have the same problem. You leave that church, you go to the next church, you have the same problem. At some point, you've got to conclude that maybe the common denominator is me. Because wherever I go, there I am. So let's deal with our stuff. That was for free for someone here today. I hope you weren't planning to leave this church, but <laughs> anyway, it just made it difficult for you. Just don't tell, don't over spiritualize stuff. But listen, some, but the, there is a spiritual reality. The great D.L. Moody said it this way. He said, "Man, I, the reason I believe that the devil is real is twofold: because the Bible says so, number one, and because I've done business with him, number two. <laughs> Have you done business with the devil?" Paul says, man, I've experienced this. There's something, and I believe it, that there is a spiritual world out there, and this spiritual world, and the devil comes. I mean, he's got a lot of aliases, hasn't he? He's called Satan. He's called the God of this world. He's called the serpent in Genesis. He's called Beelzebub. He's called, what else is he called? What? Father of lies. Yuck. I mean, he's got all sorts of names and appears in all sorts. He's the angel of light. He's the one that masquerades as the angel of light. He doesn't have big horns and a big fork. He, in fact, yeah, in the West, he's pretty well dressed normally. Okay, because many people say, well, why do we have so many demons in Africa and Asia? And those, I mean, not, you know, deepest dark places, and, and they're not here. They are right here. They're just dressed differently, right? They're just a little more sophisticated over here. Do you believe that there is a natural realm and a spiritual realm? Because this, this is a biblical worldview. Satan is, is real, and he, 
And, and the second thing we, we need to understand is this. The devil also, everyone say also, also has a plan for you. And I've got good news for you and bad news for you. God has a plan for your life. It is a good plan to prosper you, to give you a future and a hope. And Jesus said in John 10, 10, I have come that you may have life in all its fullness. I mean, that is it. That's why we as, as a church, you know, we have our menu and our recipe. Our menu is what we put on the door. We say, hey, what have we got available for you, world? What have we got available for you? And what is our menu? It says, discover more to life. That's what we've got for you because that's what Jesus came to give. You can tell anybody, what's this church got for me? Well, if, you asked, if they asked you that, just say, man, we, got, we, want, we will help you discover more to life through Jesus Christ. Okay, so the, there's a good plan from a good God, but here's the news. The devil also has a plan for you. Paul says, Satan hindered me. He stopped me. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says it this way. It says, be watchful. Be alert, be awake, because the devil, your great enemy, walks around like a roaring lion looking whom he may devour. The devil has a plan for you. If Jesus has come to give you life in all its fullness, he has the devil's plan for you to steal, kill, and destroy. And he does not have an off day. Don't wake up in the morning and say, devil, I'm feeling so bad. I mean, dad, are you, I've just had a bad day. Please leave me alone. That is the very day he's going to get on your neck. I'm just saying he's against you. He's looking to devour you. He's got plans for you. His biggest plan is to separate you from God, just to keep you away from God, to take away your faith. There is a spiritual battle. There is a clash of kingdoms. And Paul's just introducing, he, this is what he's talking about here. I wanted to come to you. Uh, God, God say, seemed to have sent me to Macedonia. And, and again, you've got to ask, well, how did the devil stop Paul? Well, he used some people, prominent people in Thessalonica to rise up, drive him out of town, then put all sorts of uh, restrictions in the, in the local government that prevented Paul from being able to come back. And Paul looks at that unjust law, and he says, Satan hindered me. So it wasn't some, just some spiritual, it, it was a spiritual thing manifesting, showing up in a natural way. And I don't know, in this city, there's a lot of, Satan preventing the kingdom going on. I want to say if you're a Christian, because you see, Thessalonica was a strategic place. I mean, this was the capital city of Macedonia. This was the gateway into Europe. This is exactly, man, if you, if you sign up to say yes to Jesus, don't think it's all going to go well. If you sign up for a mission, I mean, we've just heard these guys going on a awesome mission. Guess what? You say yes to going on one of our missions, you better be ready to, for a fight. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to wake some warrior up inside of you because we're going to find something out just now, right? This is not, um, I mean, you know, Satan prevented us. This is just, I'm just laying the groundwork here because there's another truth to come, right? So hold on. Don't get depressed right now. This word prevented over here literally means, in the Greek, means to cut in on. It's a word that is used like, like if, if there was a road and, and the enemy would come to graft, like dig trenches across the road so that to, to prevent the journey from happening. And this is what the enemy does. If you're on a journey of purpose, if you're on a journey of following Jesus, the devil's going to try whatever he can do to cut in on you. And he's got all sorts of ways of doing that. He's got a whole armory of weapon. Now, now the thing is, they're, they're not, they never knew. You can find them all across the Bible. It starts with deception. Has God really said? It continues with lies. You will surely not die if you disobey God. It continues with building pride in us. You will be like God. It continues with jealousy and blame. The woman you gave me, her fault. It continues with, again, with jealousy and envy and pride and murder with Cain versus Abel, right? 
All the way through the Bible, we see scriptures, we see his tactics being revealed. Division, jealousies, pride, envy, lust, temptations, greed. He's the father of all lies. Division, man, if there is division, you can know it's from the devil. And I just want us to be watchful and alert, as 1 Peter 5, 8 says, that the devil is walking around looking to get in on us, to cut us in, to cut in on you. There's some of you who, uh, who, who want to serve God. You, you wanna, you, you're making these commitments. You heard some of these youngsters make, uh, these teens make on the camp, but you just can't get, it's time to recognize there is a spiritual warfare for the journey you want to go on following Jesus. So what can we do about it? <laughs> I mean, if, if, if Paul ended here, would you agree that these Thessalonians would be truly depressed? I, the great apostle Paul, who came to preach the good news to you about this resurrected Jesus, I wanted to come to you, but Satan stopped me, full stop, amen. I mean, that would be seriously depressing, right? Those are spiritual realities. What's next, though? What's next? Well, it's, this is how the text goes, okay? We wanted to come to you. This is, they can't stop you. And the good news is the story doesn't stop you. This is, a, this is how it carries on. But, I see that's a bigger but. Right, listen, if but Satan stopped you, but the storm, sometimes you just got to get a bigger but. Uh-huh. If the devil gets his butt in the way, you got to get a bigger but. All right, I'm just trying to help you remember this. Paul says, listen, so Satan hindered me. He cut in on me. I couldn't come. But after all, then he continues, he says, what gives us hope and joy? And what will be, what will be our proud reward and the crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns? It is you. Yes, you are our glory and joy. Look what he's doing here. He says, look, yeah, Satan is real. He's cut in on us. He seems to have won. But... Jesus is the great victor. This is the point over here. This is the point as you look at this. The spiritual battle is real, right? Um, the devil has a plan for your life, but Christ ultimately is the victor. This is the Christian worldview. This is when we look at this reality. We look back 2,000 and just over a bit ago, and we see that there was a time when Jesus Christ conquered principalities and powers and on the cross something happened that changed everything so here's the th here's the truth christ is the victor and jesus is truly lord now let me explain that a little bit so paul saying hey satan stopped me but it's like then he says he says hang on hang on hang on i know we've just had a little scrap here we've there's been a little battle here. He cut in on us. We tried to get around, couldn't do it. But he says, hey, come on, let's look up a little bit. What is our joy? What's this really all about? Where's this going to all end? We know how it ends, don't we? He says, listen, I taught you this. We know how it's going to end. It's going to end when you and I and us are in the presence of the Lord when he comes back. You're our glory. You're our crown. That is our great victory. We might have lost a battle or two, but we have won the war. This is the Christian view. So when you are struggling with things on this earth, I want to encourage you. The, the, the temptation is to get sucked down into it and live in the valley and, and not be able to see anything. The thing is, you've got, to, you've got to rise up and you can rise up with Jesus. Notice it says, our Lord Jesus. You see, Jesus is a Lord. And the word Lord there really means he is Lord of all. He is the one who rules over everything. And since the cross, we look at it in a moment, he has the right to rule over everything. G John 1, 1 John 3 verse 8 says, For this purpose, Jesus came into this world to destroy the works of the devil. So when the devil is working, when Satan and the spiritual is working against you, there is one who came with the purpose of destroying the works of the devil. Then it says this. It says, Let's have a look. Th this is a key verse that maybe encapsulates what Christ did on the cross. 
If you're not familiar with this, let me explain this to you quickly. Right? In Colossians 2, 14 and 15, it says that he, Jesus, canceled out the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Let's pause there. So the, the, the point there is that we were all, have all sinned and fall short of God's glory, and the wages of sin is death. Death is not our keel over and die. It is separation from God. Okay? We were all separated. There was, we had missed the mark. We'd failed the test. We, had, we, we weren't any longer in the image of which, in which we were created. We, we were something different. Sin had marred us made us something else. We were separated from God. And then this says that on the cross, what Jesus did on the cross canceled that out. It says you no longer separated. He has made us one with him again. He has taken away the sin that separated us. This is, and then it carries on and says, it says, in this way on the cross, he disarmed spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory on the cross. Now, that's a powerful image. It's this image of, of a, a conquest, a Roman conquest that conquered. And then they would come back to their home city or to, to Rome, and they would, they would drag the, the conquered ones behind them and all tied up and publicly display that we have won the victory. This is the sort of image that Paul is using to encourage the Colossians over there. But he says he disarmed them. He took away the armor, the, the, the accu accu accusation, the, the, the death warrant against you. He took it away on the cross. He paid the penalty for our sin. He died on the cross in our place for our sin. And in Christ, we are a new creation. We are free. So... This is, this is what Jesus did. This is why Jesus is Lord and Jesus is the victor. When Jesus rose, he came back to his disciples and he said, Disciples, all authority has been given to me. Now go into all the world. So Jesus took back all authority that had been given away by Adam and Eve, and he took it back on the cross, and then he says, Okay, I'm giving it back to you guys. Go into all the world. And rule for me. Now you might say, well, hey, where's that victory showing up? Well, this is the mystery of the present age, that the kingdom is, but it is to come. And right now there is a battle. And it says over here that, notice that it says, it says, our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the deal. Jesus is Lord because of what he did on the cross. The question is, is he your Lord? Paul says, listen, he's my Lord. He's our Lord. We've, you believed when I preached the gospel to you. He's your Lord. And he says, he says, and we have got our crown. So he's, he says, let's make this our own. And I want to encourage you today, make this your own. This victory on the cross, he says, you can make this victory. I, I'm giving you the, the victory that I won. I'm, I'm letting you have the benefits of it. And you see, at the end, we're going to wear a crown, right? That crown is, is also the word it's like a, the, 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 the wreath that a, the winner of the Greek Olympic Games got on their heads, all right? Now, I don't have a wreath here. You're going to get one if you believe in Jesus. If he's your Lord, you too can get one at the end. Mm -hmm. We don't get that crown over here, but what we get is something else. I've got a little beret over here. This is my Navy beret. I used to be an officer in the Navy. Now, when I say that, don't get too excited because I was the most junior officer possible in the Navy. But when I was given this beret, of, something amazing happened. I got what is called authority. So as an 18-year-old, 19-year-old, just turned 19, when I walked, when I, once I got commissioned as an officer, when I walked onto our military, our Navy base, people would begin to salute me. Older people, mature people, people who've been working there for 30, 40 years, they, they would salute me. Not the higher ranking officers, but all the others that weren't officers, they would salute me. And I realized something, I have authority around here. It's not based on how mature I am, how much I know, it's based on somebody, the Navy commissioned me as an officer. And this is what happened. So, so Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus destroyed the works of the devil on the cross. And then he says, now you go. 
Now you walk in that authority. And so when you and I face spiritual battles, we want to walk into the spiritual battle as with Jesus, our Lord, having given us his authority. And I just want to encourage you as we kind of come and land this here. This is the principle. In the spiritual battle, recognize Satan's working. Don't be blind to it. Don't be ignorant to the spiritual reality that's out there. And I think just, now don't get scared over here. This is not like, recognize Satan's working and then rule over him through the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I had this dream this week. It's weird. I was, I was going somewhere. I was actually going from here to home and it was along the, the river over here. And suddenly there was a dog behind me. A couple of dogs, but one dog was like yapping at me, and, it, and I looked at it, and it was quite vicious. I didn't fear anything, but I just knew this thing was going to bite me. Has anyone ever been bitten by a dog on your butt? <laughs> you know, I've, I've been bitten a couple of times because I'm a runner, and sometimes he's going, hey, come on, get and you want to kick a thing? But for some reason, I had a tennis racket in my hand. Weird. I don't play tennis. <laughs> Sid, I play, maybe Sid's racket. And this thing was like, man, I just looked at it as this fierce, this, I wasn't afraid, but I just knew, man, you are trouble. And it was like, make the thing a bit. And then at one point, I just went and I put the tennis racket on its neck. And I just went, and I heard this breaking of the neck. And I just carried on. Oh, man. You know, the great Smith Wigglesworth once said, you know, I had a dream once. I woke up and there was a devil in right in my room. And they said, what did you do? I said, I said oh, it's you. And I went back to sleep. <laughs> Something in you. You see, when you know who you are in Christ, when you know what Jesus has done, even though there is a spiritual reality and even the devil's around, something can rise up you and begin to rule over. And I just want to encourage you with that. In the spiritual battle, recognize Satan's working. He may be doing it. Now, you might say, how do I know? Well, just assume he's involved. Right? Is it God? Is it the devil? It's both. God will always try to get the very best out of any bad situation for you. Amen. He will work all things together for good because you love him and are called by him. And the devil will always try to do the very worst out of you, uh, get the very worst for you out of the situation. That's his plan. But just, just this, is, this is how the book of Ephesians, Paul's writing to the Ephesians, also a crazy spiritual battle place. He says, finally, the, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. The devil may have all sorts of weapons, but God's also got all sorts of ways for you and I to overcome. Be strong in the Lord, not in your own strength, in the Lord, in his victory, right? Be strong in his victory and the power of his might and then he says put on the armor of god what is it help me helmet of salvation breastplate of righteousness belt of truth shoes of purpose gospel of peace and then those are all like defensive things right but then he says and take up the shield of faith all right, and the sword of the spirit all right those are offensive then you begin to and now i'm going to do some damage to the devil I believe we need to, if, as much as we defend ourselves, we put on the helmet of salvation because most of the battle is right between your ears. That's why 2 Corinthians 10 says, take hold of every thought, take it captive. If it's coming from empty philosophies, take those thoughts captive and pull them down to make them obedient to Christ because our warfare is not against flesh and blood. It's not about people, friends. It's about principalities and powers and rulers. And Jesus says, Take those thoughts captive. Pull them down. They're coming from the devil. He's not a dog. It's, he, it's, it's, a, it's a whisper. It's a, it's a deception. It's a lie. It's, it's an empty philosophy. And friends, I want to just encourage you, be watchful and awake because the devil's trying to get you. Again, not in fear, but come on. Let's, he says, let's put it on. What else? So we got the sword of the Spirit. Use Jesus, when he was tempted, what did he say? It is written right? We can do a few things. Resist. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist is not like, please leave me alone. It's like a firm stand. It's taking your stand, being unmovable, knowing what you believe and who you believe in and saying, no, no matter what, I ain't quitting. 
I ain't giving up. This is what I believe. This is who I believe in. Put on the armor of God. Bind up. Matthew 19, Jesus says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The word loose and bind, bind really means to declare something illegal and unlawful. So when you're looking at through it through your kingdom view, you've got to say to some things, that is not legal around here. That is not kingdom around here. We bind it up and we cast it out. I reckon some of you need to pray some binding prayers. Right? Not just for yourself, but you need to walk into some places. When pornography pops up on your screen, you need to say, I bind that wicked thing. Not because I'm scared and it's tempting me, but you've got to start calling it out for what it is. Start binding whoever's producing that stuff. Curse that business that's producing. Curse whatever profit is coming out from that pornography business that's tempting you, that lovely lady or man that you're looking at. Bless them and curse the business behind them. Tell them, I pray some of those Old Testament curse prayers. Pray that this pornography business will be cursed with, infested with fleas wherever their office is. May they come to nothing. May they come to bankruptcy. May they come down in Jesus' name. Come on. That spirit, don't have any pity on it. It ain't got no pity on you. Rise up with the same attitude. Expose that thing for what it is. It might be exposing itself to you, but expose it for what it is. Call it for what it is. It's deceptive. It's sin always destroys, always deceives, always leaves you empty, never fulfills its promises. Come on, when are we going to wake up? We've got to bind some things up and cast them out in Jesus' name. Man, you pray a couple of casting out prayers, something will rise up in you. I believe every Christian should pray at least one violent prayer a day. I mean, aim it at somebody, bind something up, cast it out in Jesus' name, all right? <laughs> Pull it down. Stand and having done all, stand. I've got to land this. This is how, we, how the book of Thessalonians ends, or that, that letter ends. Now, listen, when the dust is settled, you're going to stand. This is the good news. When the dust has settled on any spiritual battle, you and I Those who have Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, if that's you, you will stand. And there is a crown waiting for you, a victor's crown at the end. This is our great joy. This is our great reward. You might be losing some battles, but this is the end. This is the promise. Now may God of peace himself sanctify you or set you apart completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend. The risen one will return. Uh, This is what we believe. The risen one will return. He rose again to prove that he was who he had been prophesied to be and he was the Messiah. And because he rose again, we can also believe that he will return again with the victor's crown for you. This is the hope that we have in our spiritual battle. Amen. Let's stand together.